Welcome back. Um, busy day today. We're going to do all kinds of things. Um, what we're going to do is put the groundwork underneath our King Tiger. Now this is our Peter Laffer tank that we borrowed just temporarily just for sizing and, and the fact that Peter has his wheels on and I do not and things like that. So thanks so much for Peter Laffer for lending me his King Tiger momentarily. Um, now one of the things, gentlemen, that we left off with was making our frame and our pink foam addition to uh, add the contours to our base. Um, so one of the things that I've gone ahead off camera and done is just painted a little bit of the framework. And that's only because I don't want to get into masking the, the wood and all that sort of stuff. So when this was off the wood and um, just sitting there in, 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 in loose, sitting on the table here, I painted it. Now one of the um, things you can see is that I've painted it dark, dark brown. It's nice, um, con, uh, flows well with the wooden base. And these ones here are black. And this one here is obviously black. Um, so once you decide on the base that you're gonna do, then you can decide on which color you're gonna paint your, um, and always stay dark, gentlemen. It, it, they just don't appear to do well when they're painted beige or, or that sort of, especially if you're doing Desert Storm or, um, um, you know, Middle East type settings. It's nice if you have a nice dark contrast um, underneath. So stick with the dark colors for your, your evergreen uh, framework. Um, and the colors I use are Gloss Black, X1 Tamiya, and XF64. And the ratio would be 60% black and 40% brown. This is called Red Brown, and of course there's a little bit of Red Brown in our, in our piece of lumber here. So, um, so just base it on, 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 just base your colors of your evergreen. Um, um, let let this base dictate what you're going to do. So I mean, I, I picked these up at IKEA. These little bases here. So, you know, they're nice, tiny, and they're inexpensive. And then I obviously carry on with my um, putting the base together on top of the IKEA picture frame base. So and the same one for this. I actually had this one um, made in an art supply store, um, cut to my specifications. But um, anyway, if, if you're one of the easiest and inexpensive ways to getting these little picture frames is um, is the garage sales. You know, they're selling this god-awful piece of art, um, and they put 25 cents on it. Forget the art. Don't even look at the art at a garage sale. But look at the frame. And if it's delicate and it's, it's say, has a, a width of, say, one inch or less, um, just put it in your stash. I, I mean, unfortunately for me, I now have too many of them. I have about 25 of these little bases, but you know what? I, I don't buy them anymore. I have a nice inventory, so, um, and then I can just go down to my little frame shop, um, which is nothing more than my little space in my in my work area, and I have a whole series of frames, <clears throat> mostly with ugly art, but um, like I say, I've been buying these things, guys, for 50 cents, 25 cents, sometimes a dollar at, at a garage sale. And all I really want is the frame itself. Um, and then if I want to move over to something tiny like this, and I didn't have a frame on hand, I just went up to Ikea. Could have been Walmart. Um, I don't quite remember where I got this, but it was one store or the other. And they're just go and get a small picture frame and um, obviously take out the glass and the, and the hardware that comes with it and inserted our pink foam and I don't know where we go. You guys um, remember when we were working on this piece of wood here, this is actually a plaque from a from some sort of award that I picked up. Um, it it might have been a, a thing for a guy who was retiring from business or whatever. I just peeled off the plaque and I had this nice wooden frame underneath and then um, lo and behold it, it's now turned into a nice base. So. Anyway, so there, th that part of it is very inexpensive, and of course there's evergreen stock wrapped around the frame. And again, inexpensive, 30 thou, 40 thou plastic. Um, so one of the, one of the things um, 
about this groundwork is is the it's very inexpensive and you can do a great job if you just want to avoid this and have your king tiger sit on your base or your steward that's no problem at all sitting on your white tablecloths um obviously you don't have to go this route you know but when i have all these put together in my display cabinet my display cabinet is much more attractive you know i have uh, eastern front settings and french and you know monte casino and that sort of stuff and I, and I can categorize them in my shelves. I can I can do all kinds of things, shift them around every month or so. Um, you know, American and Commonwealth vehicles on one side of my shelf and German or Italian on the other. So there's different ways, but when you put them together with a little bit of groundwork, guys, it just, um, it just sort of brings it all together. And if you remember in the 70s when all we did was build models, put them on our little shelves, and then... Sh we bought the monogram ones that had those beautiful shepherd pain diorama inserts this this whole hobby changed overnight as soon as we bought those monogram kits with those shepherd pain um tear sheets in them with 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 broken buildings and groundwork and, and storytelling all our little modeling suddenly became miniatures you know they they were no it was, they were no longer models they were they were miniatures of the real thing and then hats off to Shep. He, uh, I think he, in the 70s, changed this whole, whole hobby. And um, thank God he did, because think of the uh, joy that we've all had since, you know. But he just sort of, he was the pathfinder of the, of the, of the thing. But, um, so let's um, add all our groundwork this morning. And, and these things, guys, are very easy to do. But the advanced result, when they're done... Um, yeah, this, they're just the simplest thing to do is, is groundwork and stuff you just have to you know be patient let plaster dry don't rush it um and one of the things too is none of us probably around today other than in a museum have seen these tanks in real life operational or in combat zones or whatever so the colors are close enough if they're not dead on we really can't compare because we weren't standing there in World War II. But one of the things that we com can compare every single day is the groundwork, the blades of grass, the color of the soil. All those things are things that we do in parks and we do when we, you know, go to lakesides and all that sort of stuff, streams and ponds and, and go on hikes with our girlfriends and what have you. So it's very important to have the right colors on your groundwork. And too many dioramas, guys, um, hit you in the eye <clears throat> the wrong way when the groundwork is done incorrectly. You're, it just clangs against your eyeballs. You know, bright, bright green grass. and It looks like Tiger Woods just hit a hole in one in Augusta, Georgia. You know, it, it, it doesn't work like that. That's not the type of grass we're looking for underneath these combat vehicles. So... Pay very close attention to your surroundings around your own home, you know, as far as the parks and the, um, you know, places that you like to go and hike. Because those are the um, visuals that you're going to need to to accomplish what we're going to do here in miniature. So, so just keep all these sort of things in mind. And, and you know, I recently saw a World War One Peter Jackson um, film where he was doing the um, colorization of. Um, this World War One footage from 100 years ago. And one of the things he says in the end is, is how painstakingly he spent his time doing the groundwork coloring. He said it was so vital simply because everybody is so familiar with it. So we have to, we have to take that same approach when we're doing our groundwork. So, so keep with the earth tone colors. Look at your magazines and your books that have color in them and duplicate it that way and it's it, honest to god guys it's the simplest thing to do i'm going to show you some very very um advanced results but with very simple little skills so <clears throat> i'm gonna put these beautiful tanks away um and then we're gonna get down to our groundwork so bear with me just for a second okay so one of the um 
things I like to do is I like to sit my tanks on on this little platform here because once I start laying down the stones and the um, plaster and what have you um, the tank tracks and wheels sometimes um, I build these things two months in advance and then I get to this part and I don't know what the contours and the suspension is gonna have to be shifted and moved in the early construction of that tank so uh, one way around that is number one the King Tiger can now sit on a table without any groundwork or I build myself what I call stretchers or and stretchers is a, is a term that comes from building wooden chairs in the olden days but you know all the framework around which supports the legs underneath a chair this is not unlike that so I've picked the word stretcher but you can call it anything you want it's it's just basically a stand or a base for the tank to sit on and the beautiful thing is is now I can alter with plaster underneath my little stretcher here and and have the tank sit on any angle I wish providing you put these little struts in you have to put those in and, and it's just gentlemen it takes all of three minutes to make one of these things you have to line up your tank to match our parallels here but nevertheless these little tracks are exactly fitting underneath and, and each tank unfortunately is different you can't go out and make five or six of these um, you got to build one for the panther one for the king tiger one for our little Stuart here and if I pick up the Stuart there's our little stretcher buried and painted the same identical color as the groundwork so you can barely even see it in there but the tank is always going to sit flat as flat is i never have to worry that my groundwork has been uh, you know not level my tank is always going to sit level because my tank is always sitting on my little frames here so i um built this to fit the king tiger and once again thanks to Peter Laffer for lending me his King Tiger which is already constructed and finished and as long as I'm careful with it I'm sure that we can move forward so what I've done is to make that little stretcher it's just about a sixteenth of an inch narrower than the track itself so and that's only because then we can definitely hide it we paint it with the ground colors you know all the frame and everything so that you're never gonna see it no one has ever said Dave you're uh, you know your framework underneath the tank is showing you got to get more bushes under it or whatever that that's never the case because it's built it's just slightly smaller than the tank footprint so that's an easy thing to make and it takes um all of three minutes to make but it but it's a lifesaver down the road when we're starting to add the add the groundwork so so if you can spend a little bit of time and like i say now i can put the groundwork underneath and um, the tanks always gonna sit perfectly on our little framework here so it doesn't matter how the contours of the ground go my tank is gonna sit properly and straight and not have to worry about swinging suspension and all that sort of stuff now I have in the past especially with t-34s and um, t-34s is one of the best to alter the uh, suspension because that that loose track that a T-34 has versus, say, the Stewart, which is a very tight, I think they call it a live track. Um, you know, swinging the suspension isn't as important on that as, say, having fun doing it with a T-34 um, well in advance, in other words, during the construction period. And then you can alter your groundwork to fit how you've um, altered the axles on, say, a T-34 or, or uh, quite a few Russian vehicles, actually. So... There is advantages to altering the axles on the tanks too. But anyway, let's let's get on to getting the plaster in here. All right, so the plaster I'm going to use is just an easy fill, which is a drywall paste that I get at Home Depot. Um, I use that just economics. It's, it's inexpensive. It's uh, very strong. It um, lends itself to what we like to do here. And I just um, apply just now. This isn't just a kitchen knife, gentlemen. Let's not um, let's not get in hot water using 
our wives good cutler here. Let's just, once again, go to a garage sale. You're going to always find these at a garage sale. Pick up three or four for your hobby. Because if you go to your kitchen <laughs> and use your wife's cutlery, you're doomed. Your groundwork making days are over. Whereas for 25 cents, you can pick these up. You can go to Walmart and pick them up for $2. So... Whatever you do, guys, don't. The hobby's supposed to be a fun time, not hot water time. So, just a little home economics. Now, with the groundwork, I, I go right to the edge and up and over. And you don't have to worry about the top of this frame. You can just, with a piece of uh, sandpaper, you can rub it off later. Now, you also notice, too, guys, that I haven't painted all the way to the top. And that's because I'm going to probably be cleaning this up slightly with some 600 or 400 sandpaper because plaster is what it is. It gets on top of things so I don't paint all the way to the top and ruin my paint job I just worry about that later and as far as mixing the color it's gonna be pretty easy using using these to duplicate the brown that I've already got there so um, so don't worry about that don't worry about the top of your evergreen base Now, I, these little platforms are to form puddles later on. So I'm going to go around those with our groundwork. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll work on this on camera for another minute or so. And then I'll go and do this whole thing quickly without narration. And, and, and then we... We'll put the hair dryer to it and dry it up quick. Now, when you're going to use a hair dryer to dry your groundwork, sometimes cracks will form. Leave the cracks there. Don't don't come back a secondary day or, or tomorrow and start filling in the cracks. The cracks are just part of part of Mother Nature. So just let if 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 this is drying and. Your uh, plaster is taking on a mind of its own as far as cracks and what have you. Um, just let it be. Just just build the cracks into your the environment that so as you can see guys, it's it's like putting icing on a cake. Okay, so now we take our um, our base, our tank base. Now, what I've done, guys, is I've I've just cut small little grooves into the evergreen framework, just slightly, as if there's a little bit of contour due to the weight of the tank moving along here. So those are going to be sort of how I line this up. That's about right. And make sure, guys, that you don't put your struts on the top side, because otherwise you're, they're going to bump into the track. So make sure that the struts are on the downside. So now you can see how it's... Let me just get our king tiger. And now you're going to see that the, the tiger is embossed or rides up a little high. So now what you're going to do is now you're going to take some of our plaster mix... And now build up to the frame itself. So in other words, we're going to have to add the thickness of this uh, frame up around the sides. And that will just turn it invisible. Now if, if the camera switches to the Stuart there, you can see how the, the groundwork rides up a little bit. And it gives the tank a little bit of weight. So there's no way you can see the stretcher under there. It's, it's Like I say, it's, it's almost invisible. And um, what I'm going to do now... 
just bring the groundwork up another quarter inch or sixteenth of an inch to meet our stretcher and then we're all set and then what I want to do is also show how these puddles are going to work so let's bring up the uh, see how the puddles starting to take shape there and, and once again use these inexpensive brushes we're just going to make miniature little shorelines around these little puddles here like so you can't get in there with your little kitchen knife to to form these sort of contours but and the contours aren't really going to be um too detailed simply because we're, we're also going to add a lot of dirt and all that sort of jazz on here so we don't have to be super accurate and super detailed about the shoreline of these little puddles here but you can see, see how easy it is to to form up Give our little dried up stream a little bit of a undercut. And these these guys, just these little brushes here, just buy them at the dollar store. Once again, don't use Winsor Newton brushes on groundwork, whatever you do. These are, this is all a dollar store type of thing. Just get a little more plaster. Oh, anyway, let, let's skip the puddles for now, and we'll, let's get at our little. Uh... See, so now I'm bearing the cross pieces, just plastering them right in there, guys. Just that's there to stay now. Just go right over top of your framework and don't whatever you do get any plaster on this you're gonna have to sand it off later so so now on the outside now the buildup comes now the weight of the tank is starting to show its colors and keep in mind that this is a 16th in 16th or so smaller than your tank just so that we can hide it so keep that in mind too. So in other words, it's not as wide. A little bit on the back here. And it's just, like I say guys, like Putting icing on a cake. I'll just do the front of our diorama here. And you'll see very quickly as the groundwork starts pulling together um, how easy it is to hide so that your tank isn't floating. And just by building up a little bit of a ridge around our framework. Um, the tank's never going to look like it's 60 ton tank or 45 ton tank and it's riding on the groundwork that's, you know, so now our, our little stretcher, our little base is now hidden away. Put a little dab here and a little bit in the front end. And again, you can just sit there with your our little brushes here and then just fine tune this a little bit with our brushes. And then what we're gonna do 
Now this is uh, this is a setting where it's either uh, it's certainly not on the um, it's on the Western Front or in Germany. So little pieces of uh, stone, you know, it, it's uh, it's not like Monte Cassino, like the there uh, you can't really see them. There's not a lot of stones in my little base there. But if this was an Italian setting, you might be digging into these rocks quite a bit. But due to the fact that uh, our theater war is slightly different, um, don't don't start filling up these things with stones. They're nice to paint. They add a little texture to our diorama, but certainly uh, certainly don't go wild with all this. I, I mean, even though we're dealing with a, uh, you know, there's always going to be some kind of stones, but also too these these tanks, um, you know, they they went across farmers fields and stuff like that places where crops are growing and stuff like that the, the farmers gotten rid of all the stones so um don't go crazy with the stones three or four are good enough they're fun to paint add a little texture here and there and i just bury them into the groundwork and once i start putting on the sand and what have you um they just about disappear anyway so just a little bit what, like I say, just a little bit of texture never hurt. And just bury them in. The other nice thing is that the, the stones are always nice to put a little bit of vegetation that gathers around them. You know, so keep that stuff in mind too. They're nice to have, but um, don't overdo it. If you're going to do an Italian campaign, sure, you can double or triple the amount of stones that we have here, but... But don't go too wild. Now, one of the things I'll do is um, just I'm going to let this sit off camera for about 10 minutes. That's all I need. And then we'll start pressing in the track or the formation of the uh, tracks that would have been here on the travel of the tank. And remember, our tank is is, is finished. It's It's been blown up. Um, it didn't make the tank tracks, um, you know, in the last 10 minutes of, of real time the tank's been sitting here for three or four days so um one of the things we'll do is we'll we'll make some tank tracks but they're certainly going to be the dried type you know they're, they're it's not going to be churned up mud or anything like that like i say our tank is somewhat derelict so um we have to show that in our in our in our diorama as well so let this sit off camera to dry and then we'll um we'll come back momentarily and and, and put some tracks in all right okay so we have our this is a spare king tiger track that i have um so if you are um you prefer to use aftermarket tracks such as frule track or uh, the different brand names out there that's fine but one of the things you shouldn't ever get rid of are your rubber band track because th these are the things that we're going to lay down here to give the impression in the dirt so, and you need the rubber band stuff to do this. You, you can, I suppose, do it with a piece of frule track, but then you're going to get plaster all over them and, and, and have to sit there and clean them up with a toothbrush and everything. So, um, the impressions that we're going to put in this ground don't necessarily need the detail that, say, frule tracks are going to do. So, don't don't sit here and pound your frule tracks into the ground. It's um, You're going to find that there's more bother cleaning it all up than... And it's worth but one of the things also is i'm just going to lay down a little bead of fine fine sand in here just like so because inside the track um pressing the footprint of these tracks is going to obviously be sandy so i'm just going to put a little bit of sand back in here and pat it down So this is only the adhesion for this is strictly the wet plaster. And so when you give this the shake test afterwards, you're going to shake a lot of this off. But nevertheless, you need some to make our impression. So remember, our tank is 50 tons. So um, now one of the things that you're going to have to do is dip the track in some water. I'm just dampen it a little bit. It just helps when it 
comes to lifting this back off the plaster, it comes up pretty easily. Now this isn't going to um, make or break your dye around. This this part of it is is necessary to do. You're going to have to show an impression in there. And presto, there's your tank track. So you can see how um, it's important to lay down that little bed of sand moving forward. And then what you're going to do is you're going to let that dry overnight and then come back and you, you can sprinkle a little extra sand on it if you need. Um, now let's just get the second one going here. So it's easy to line up, guys, because you've got your... Don't forget, you've got your piece here lining this up for you. So just press it in gently. And you can't do this a second time. You've got to get this right the first time. So, and then presto, there's your tracks. There's your 50-ton tank going through a farmer's field. Just, uh, you can mop, mop up the, there's a little bit of water from the track. You can mop that up with a, with a tissue if you want. But just be careful because you don't want to lose the indent. This, all I'm doing here is picking up the water that I used to put on the track just so it dries a little quicker. So it's very easy to do, gentlemen, just uh, laying it in behind and then and then the next time we film these these are gonna you know these are gonna really shine you know when we when we start to paint which is in our next episode th these are gonna um, and then I'll, what I'll do is I'll steal some of the color that's washed up on the track of my proper King Tiger and then um, and I'll use those same colors so that the so that the groundwork on the track and the mud you know caught up in the bogies of whatever tank you're working on it has to match so um, all that sort of stuff is gonna is, is gonna come together and it's gonna it's just gonna give a fantastic presentation to your model so um, and this is just one more you know element or one more little neat little thing that you do and as you saw it took me all of about 10 seconds to create these you know these tank impressions so um, just be careful when you do it because you've only got one shot to do it. You can't go back and sort of say, well, that looks like hell. I'm going to have to redo this thing. What you're going to have to do is take out a little bit of plaster, smooth it all out, and then go through the whole process 100% a second time. You can't sort of fit these um, uh, tank tracks in amongst those tank tracks to try and make it work a second time if you, if you don't like the result. You're going to have to basically start at square one again. So just be cautious when doing it, and then what's going to happen, like I say, this is going to dry overnight, and then next time we're together, we'll start the painting, and the painting process is as simple as can be, um, and it just adds one more little thing to your tank. It, it no longer is going to sit on, you know, a white tablecloth. It's, it's going to be, you know, sitting in its, you know, in this case, Berlin or you know, the far reaches of France. So, in any event, there's today's episode. And, uh, oh, just one more thing to point out is our little puddles. These little puddles, which were, um, as you guys know, evergreen stock, are now going to be, you know, filled with water. And it's just, once again, it's another little um, part of our diorama, just for texture and what have you. I'm going to off-camera put some tracks from our little jeep in here um and we'll just okay on. so one of the other things i like to do is use real sand real sand from the garden and um i either get it out of my own garden or i take it off a construction site or whatever um just a little tupperware container with a little few little um, stones in it and what have you but um that's the best stuff to use but keep in mind, too, you're going to have to paint this. You can't use this in its natural color. Don't ask me why, but 35th scale tanks, 
and one to one scale sand color wise just doesn't seem to ever work so keep in mind that you're gonna have to paint this but I just um, I'll just do a little bit here and then I'll do the rest off camera but I just start laying it in and put on extra sand because you're gonna give this a shake test which is turning this diorama upside down tomorrow or the next day once it starts to harden and um, any loose stuff you have to get off because otherwise when you fire up your airbrush to paint it it gets blown off and then it ends up all over your house so or all over your workbench or all over your modeling area so once I put the sand on let it dry 24 hours and I pat this down with my just finger just press it in once again very simple to do I'll do a lot of this off camera I'll do say 25 percent of this on camera and then carry on at home but um, what I'll do tomorrow is I'll turn it upside down and shake off the excess stuff because like I say doing it with my airbrush might sound like a great idea but then before you know it, you've got it all over your your working area and the Now as far as our little river or little dried rivers or stream here, you want to get your bigger stones down towards the bottom because it's obvious there's a ridge here. Gravity will pull the heavier stones down. So if you've got a little bit of extra um, bigger stones and what have you put those along the bottom because obviously gravity will tug those down anyway so they weigh a little more and they will fall so just put my little bigger ones around the bottom you can see them similar on my Stuart you can see where I've got a few of the bigger ones along the bottom there so keep all that sort of thing in mind that's once again just go out into the, your hiking fields and just let Mother Nature tell your eyes how this is supposed to read. Obviously, there's tons of photographs to help you out with that, too. Hiking magazines and that sort of stuff. But anyway, I'm going to go around the whole diorama, put all these stones in, put the sand in. And then the next time we're together, we'll, we'll begin to paint. And one of the things I, I do, and I, I've said it in the past with my Panther diorama, is that I'm going to paint this whole surface flat black. And those are going to create the shadows around these little stones. And then we're going to bring them up with um, different ground colors. Uh, Buff is one of my favorites, number 57 from the Tamiya range. Um, but all that moving forward, and that's all coming in our next episode. So I look forward to seeing you then. Take care and have a great week.